Nat his cam, which I'm going to talk about, is a study of the natural history of Cambridge. Um, it's, it was started in uh, 2016 by Mark Hill and the Cambridge Natural History Society. Uh, and the aim has been to produce a snapshot of the plants and the animals that are found in, in Cambridge. Uh, now, hang on. Uh, just get that over there. That's it. Right. Um, my initial role in the project was to produce a film uh, and record what was going on. And I made a short film for the opening meeting saying what I would, e would expect that we'd find. Uh, and unfortunately, I got the message completely wrong, uh, as you'll see during this talk. Um, Mark Hill produced this poster um, uh, to try and explain what we were hoping to achieve. Uh, Cambridge is full of wildlife, more than the surrounding countryside. It's a hot spot of species richness and seen from space, it's mainly green. That was, that were, they were Mark's initial opening remarks. Uh, we're going to try and produce uh, 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 and raise the awareness of the people of, uh, of Cambridge uh, to the wildlife in their city. Uh, and eventually we hope to produce one or two books. Uh, we hoped to cover the plants and the animals in great depth. Uh, it was a wonderful concept. This is a map of the area uh, from OpenStreetMap with the Ordnance Survey grids superimposed so that our area is bounded on the west by the A4, uh, on the west by the M11 and on the north by the A, uh, A14. And you can see that we have covered the whole area, a whole built up area of Cambridge and, and also some of the surrounding agricultural land around, around the actual urban centre of the city. With the rate that Cambridge is expanding, I'm sure that the whole of this map will soon be urban and that the agricultural areas will be pushed back. But there is a lot of green on the map as well as quite a few aquatic habitats. This is the team with some very distinguished scientists and some very enthusiastic natural, uh, local naturalists. Uh, and everybody had a different role and we all brought something different to the, to the project. Uh, we seem to get on wonderfully well and we've had meetings originally in the David Attenborough Center uh, where we then retired to the Eagle Pub afterwards. Uh, but, but more recently we've been on Zoom. It's been a wonderful experience uh, and uh, I, actually it, it's been very good for the society uh, and all of us have had a real sense of purpose, particularly during these difficult times that we've had recently. We created a web page which was edited by Monica Frisch uh, and it had a constant flow of blog entries recording our progress and we've had visitors to the site from all over the world. As an example of one of the interesting activities, Paul Rule had his garden surveyed by the team. We've actually chosen 64 gardens, one in each of the grid squares across the city. Uh, and Paul had his garden surveyed by the team. Uh, and since then, he, he's been recording everything he can find in his small garden, just to try and get an idea of how many species were present. This is his moth trap, which actually has contributed a good number of records. Uh, and this is a breakdown of what he found. It included nine Odonata species, which are shown in the blue blocks down the bottom. And his pond is very small, and so it's remarkable that it should attract so many dragonflies and damselflies. But in reality, many garden ponds could have a similar list. In total, he found 737 species in, in the four years he's been doing it. Jennifer Owen, in her classic book, found 2,673 species in 30 years. So Paul's got 26 years to find another 1,936 species. Unfortunately, Jennifer Owen's book is no longer in print. My own dragonfly project started from a disagreement. I've been a trustee of Hobson's Conduit which was named after Thomas Hobson, the famous 17th century carrier, who's famous for Hobson's choice. He rented horses to students and, and they had what he offered them or they didn't get a horse at all. Um, and he made a good living from this and he was a great benefactor in the city. 
and he funded the building of this conduit, which was to flush out the King's Ditch, which was basically an open sewer. Uh, it was a sort of fortification. I think they filled it with sewage to make it suitably disgusting. Uh, anyway, it was a source of public complaint uh, and Thomas Hobson wanted to flush it out. So he bought water uh, along this conduit. Uh, but there was a plan to dredge the, the, two, the top two feet of sediment from uh, our two kilometer section of the conduit to improve it. Uh, well, I wanted to show that um, if they removed all that sediment, which was a vast amount involving lots of lorries, it would actually be removing all of the living organisms as well. Um, it's a lovely section of conduit. It has a marvelous display of water violets, uh, water violets and water voles. Um, it's, it's a beautiful bit of, of, of Cambridge. Uh, in just a few hours, I managed to clock up nine species. Um, you can see some of them here. Um, and when I presented my photos and species list, I think it made quite an impact. And certainly the trustees adopted a very different approach, having initially been guided by engineers rather than biologists. Now this was in June, 2018. Uh, and I'd made a list, not just of what I hoped, uh, or just what I'd seen, but what I hoped we'd see. Uh, I've made a little list, but it occurred to me that I should be doing this on a wider scale for Nat Hiscam right across Cambridge. I've had access to the insect collections, both in Cambridge at the Zoology Museum and at the Oxford Natural History Museum. And I have to say that their collections are amazing with some specimens going right back to the time when Latin names were first being given to species. And from these visits, I've come away with two overriding impressions. One is that those specimens are incredibly fragile. Uh, I was terrified at, 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 at working with them, but that none of them, well, at least very few, actually came from the city. Um, it seems that odontologists of the past prefer to go to rural environments to collect their specimens. And only 30 specimens of several thousand that I looked at came from Cambridge. This specimen, which I initially got very excited about, was in Oxford. It's a red veined darter caught by Sir Arthur Pickard in Cambridge in May 1953. At least that's what I thought. I hadn't found any red veined darters, and I thought it might be very exciting to find a breeding population hidden in some corner of the city. Unfortunately, when I started to investigate it, I discovered that his name wasn't Sir Arthur Pickard. It was Sir Arthur Pickard Cambridge. He lived in Oxford. He was vice chancellor of Sheffield University and he died in 1952. So it seems this label is from the date that his widow gave the collection to the museum and this dragonfly didn't come from Cambridge at all. Many of you will remember the old Dragonfly Centre at Wiccan, and it was here shortly after the opening that I attended an identification course uh, run by none other than Rory Mackenzie Dodds. And I have to say that his enthusiasm for the subject is far more infectious than the coronavirus, uh, and I suspect the R8 for his courses must be huge. I picked up the essentials of dragonfly uh, identification there, and I've been photographing them ever since. So it seemed obvious to apply this to the surveying of dragonflies in Cambridge. And it's sad that the centre had to close. I picked out the likely water bodies around the city, and I divided them into sites for 2018 and sites for 2019, arranging a convenient cycle route around the various sites I was doing which would allow me to make regular visits. I wanted to make the survey very accurate, so I decided to photograph or try to photograph every specimen that I saw. That way I could, I could look at my photographs in the evening and check my identifications on, on my return home. I rejected my trusty old SLR camera in favour of a Nikon B700 bridge camera, much lighter with a very large telephoto zoom range, 60 times, and, and an excellent image stabilizer and very light so that I could actually zoom in on specimens and, and not have that frustrating uh, happening that um, you know they fly away just as you're about to press the shutter. 
Well, later I switched to a Canon SX60, and bo but both cameras are very similar, and they allowed me to get in close from a long way away. Uh, this is the viewfinder through the, um, the viewfinder sight through the B700, um, which is in here in bird watching mode, which is a very convenient way of actually having a very small spot focus, which allowed me to get just the insect and avoid all the vegetation, which, which can be a big problem when photographing dragonflies. Um, I'll take you around some of the sites, uh, at least just a few of the interesting sites. This is Ditton Meadows, and it's the site with the highest species diversity in Cambridge. It has 21 species. Um, it's mainly ditches. Uh, there's a sec small section of cam along there as well. Uh, and in medieval times, this was close to the site of the largest fair in Europe. Um, Newton used to attend the fair, and he purchased a lot of scientific equipment there. It was last held in 1933. You can see here a view across one of the ditches uh, with the village of Fenditton in, in the distance. In spring, it's one of the best places to find the hairy hawker. Um, and it's also the only site in Cambridge where the variable damselfly is found. You can see here the sort of classic exclamation mark on the, on the thorax. Uh, and you can find them in very good numbers in May and June. So it's a, if you're interested in variables, it's a, it's a great place to come to. In August 2019, southern migrant hawkers turned up on Ditton Meadows. There'd been a lot of excitement over their discovery at Kwai Fen, and it seemed that they were breeding there. So I went to look in Ditton Meadows just in case they might be present. And to my complete surprise, I found them. Uh, this was the first really unusual species that had turned up in the survey. So I was very excited by it. Uh, and they'd been breeding there again, in, or, or they were there again in July 2020. So I think they may well be breeding. Ditton Meadows is without doubt the best spot for dragonflies in Cambridge. It was the first location that the uh, emerald damselflies turned up, and I'm sure that scarce chaser will appear there one day. If you want to see scarce chasers, just go through the village of Fendit, and the cam flows under the A14 bridge. Uh, so it's this section of the cam that the scarce chasers emerge in big numbers in June. And if you get there on the right day, they can be mating couples all over the bankside vegetation. Scarce chasers are quite common in Cambridgeshire and they can be found right up into the fens. This is about as far south as they come, although there are a few down south in Shepra. This is in Cambridgeshire. We've been moth trapping in the University Botanic Gardens. So I've combined moths with dragonflies on my visits. Um, both, oh, and I should just say, um, th this is the Botanic Garden Lake. It's got 16 species with, uh, in it, or, or so far that I've found. It's very shallow with emergent vegetation and it's in this lovely formal garden setting. Both uh, hairy and brown hawkers are found here. And uh, on the left, this unfortunate brown hawker was mating and a young moorhen was watching and saw its chance for a meal dived in and grabbed one. The price of true romance. Um, we've started to look at the nymphs in the pond and this is definitely a work in progress. I think that the nymphs are very understudied and uh, so we've started to uh, to see just what there is there. Um, there are a number of um, chalk or, or former chalk pits in Cambridge and this is one um, which is now a fishing lake in Cherry Hinton. It was, it was a former quite a deep chalk pit um, and it has uh, 17 species. It's about in the middle, or there's a uniform depth of about 30 feet, which I think is probably too deep for very much vegetation to grow. Uh, and uh, so it's in the shallow margin around the edge where you actually get uh, really quite good um, dragonflies and damselflies. The lake is populated by huge carp. Um, they really are very large. And if you stand on that chalk cliff in the background and look down into the lake, you can see these things. They look like, like dolphins, they're huge. Um, some of them up to 40 pounds. Um, and, and the margins are also populated with lots of grass snakes. 
as the summer progresses, the water lilies grow out into the lake and otters have recently found their way into the lake as well. The fishermen are very worried about their specimen carp. Um, numerous hawkers and emperors patrol the lake margins. Here's a southern hawker on the bankside vegetation. And both red-eyed and small red-eyed are present in the lakes. The red-eyed seem to be a little earlier than the small red-eyed and they're often found on the water lily leaves. And you can see here from this photo, the difference in the markings at the end of the abdomen. Barnwell pit uh, is very similar in origin to the chalk pits. It was actually a brick pit, so it had clay in it. Um, it's, it's a very good site. Uh, at the moment, access is difficult, um, but uh, the Chisholm Trail is being constructed. It's a bicycle route through the centre of Cambridge following the railway line and it will go along the edge of this lake. Um, now this lake used to be about the same depth as the as the Cherryington Lakes, about 30 feet or 10 metres deep. And uh, when one of the uh, shopping centres in Cambridge was constructed, the clay they got from the foundations was dumped in in this lake and brought the um, depth up and it's now uniformly two or three well two two and a half meters deep um, and there's a lot of water lilies and emergent vegetation uh, scarce chasers are found here also um, so there's two sites for scarce chasers the cam and, and, and this at the chisholm uh, at the barnwell pit uh, this is the first place i found willow emeralds um, and um, here they are egg laying on willow, but they don't just use willow. And this is um, a patch of egg laying. You can see the scars of the egg laying on this privet plant, which is on the edge of the lake. Uh, and you can see they've obviously been successful because a lot of the scars show where the um, young larvae have emerged. This photo was taken in 2014. 19 and and at first i thought it was a rather faded emperor but i wasn't too sure and i started to look at the photos on the web and wondered if it might be a female lesser emperor it hadn't got the blue saddle which was quite confusing i sent it to val perrins our local dragonfly recorder uh, who said mm, yeah, it's probably just a faded emperor but i'll ask around uh, this egg, this photo shows it actually egg laying and I've got a video of it egg laying and it's not in tandem and apparently um, lesser emperors supposed, are supposed to egg lay in tandem. Anyway, I posted it on the Dragonflies Facebook page and Adrian Parr confirmed that it was a lesser emperor, much to my great delight uh, and another exciting discovery. Uh, in, in 2020, I also found them uh, in Trumpington Meadows. This is Hobson's Park, which is a, a newly created green area on the southern side of the city, which has been sculpted out of farmland. Um, it, it's it's uh, sort of come about as a uh, as a result of planning gain that, that you know the uh, huge area of farmland was put over to to be developed, and 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 this area was then preserved as as green as green area. Um, this is Mark Hill leading a, a party into an interesting ditch uh, during one of the bio blitz um, days that we've had. And um, there have been lots of interesting, um, interesting habitats created uh, and, and, and lots of interesting species have been brought in. Um, the aquatic habitats have been built around the attenuation ponds of the sustainable urban drainage scheme. And these are excellent dragonfly habitats and 17 species have moved in very quickly to occupy them. Um, Black-tailed skimmers are particularly common. Um, and uh, here's a nice violacea form of blue-tailed damselfly. Then finally on this tour of sites, uh, we come to another created habitat at Trumpington, Med uh, at Trumpington. it's Trumpington Meadows. Um, again, part of a large development uh, on, a on former agricultural land, and this site is now run by the Wildlife Trust. 
and they've built this really good viewing platform on the lake. And as the wind blows across the reed beds and across this viewing platform, it creates turbulent air in, in the lee of each of those. And dragonflies ride on the, on the turbulent air on windy days. And you get really, really good views. Um, here's a lesser emperor surfing the wind behind the viewing platform. So this is the second lesser emperor that I found. Uh, hit this time a male and unfortunately with the with the blue uh, blue saddle on on the abdomen and and the um, and the classic green eyes of the of the lesser emperor um, it's also got huge populations of small red da eyed damselflies which come out to mate our mass so again this pond has been colonized very very quickly if you look at some of the results i've got this is this is the results for the ditches um, I, I, I've actually done, I think, 600 um, visits to the sites to do recording. So there's been a lot of time spent um, collecting data. Uh, the, the ditches, King's College, Logan's Meadow, Queen's, Cofen and Ditton Meadows. You can see then down, down the left hand side, the, the damselflies and dragonflies. Uh, and I'm really here just showing the, the presence or absence of the species, but I have actually collected more quantitative data. Um, there are five places uh, of ditch habitats shown here. Um, Ditton Meadows is the exceptionally good site with 21 species, um, but it does have a section of cam alongside the, the Ditton Meadows, which helps the diversity uh, King's College is often photographed from that classic view on the backs. And if only the tourists lowered their cameras, they'd be able to photograph 10 different species of dragonflies. But of course, they're distracted by the architecture. Of the ponds, uh, the attenuation ponds of Hobson's Park are supporting 17 species. At Barnwell East uh, Nature Reserve, there's a very small pond and it has 19 species but unfortunately a pollution incident put pay to that and they were all wiped out in 2020. There, uh, there are some signs of recovery at the end and at the end of last season the, the dragonflies started to return but I wait to see what happens this year. The other place to note from this table is Nightingale Avenue. It's a small pond in a community garden and fairly recently, uh, it, it had nine, nine species created within a very short time. It's a great inspiration for how really good wildlife gardening can, can produce good results. Barnwell, the, these are the lakes, Barnwell Pit and Trumpington Meadow Lakes are both outstanding at 18 and 19 species each. Uh, but a lot of these lakes uh, all of them are, are man-made and uh, a lot of them are fairly recent. Grantchester Meadows was wonderful in 2019 uh, on the CAM. So most of these flowing water habitats are on, by, on the CAM, although the last two, Cherrington Brook and Hobson's Conduit, are both chalk streams. Um, but in Grantchester Meadows, 2019 was wonderful and, and that's when I found um, a white-legged damselfly uh, um, on, on, on the um, riverside vegetation. But in 2020, unfortunately, with the lockdown being eased, everybody treated Grunchester Meadows as the local beach. Uh, and there were so many people and so much punting. I mean, it really was, it was like Brighton Beach on a hot day, not a dragonfly to be seen. Uh, the River Cam, north of Fenditton, is also extremely good, uh, and, uh, and that's the place to see scarce chasers. While you're watching, they, they, they emerge when the university bumping races are taking place, so uh, if you want to watch the bumps and dragonflies at the same time, that's the place to go. The bycatch of my study, the, the, the other species, um, have been a delight as well. These great crested greaves managed to breed on the fishing lakes two years in succession, very successfully. Uh, I've seen more grass snakes in the last two summers, probably two or three a week. Um, uh, they are present and, and when you're standing there quietly watching for dragonflies, 
they emerge quite, quite, quite well. Uh, we've got our water voles back in Cambridge, thanks to the elimination of mink along the CAM. Uh, and, and there is a scheme now for, to try and get rid of them throughout East Anglia. Um, our water voles are huge. Um, they're as big as guinea pigs and they're jet black rather than dark brown. Uh, the little grebes are breeding on Trumpington Lakes. Uh, small pike are probably eating all the dragonfly larvae and the Cherrington fishing lakes. There are lots of hoverflies and spiders to be added to the species totals for our surveys. But special mention must be made of the white leg damselfly. Um, only one record of a nymph existed for the city and that was a long time ago. But in 2019, I found this one in Grantchester Meadows, which is why I was so saddened by the madness there in 2020. It's one of a, is it, I mean, is it one of a small population? Uh, is it a dispersing individual from a distant population? Or are there more pockets of them to be discovered, discovered in the upper reaches of the CAM? Um, if you look at the distribution on eye record of uh, the white legged damselfly around Cambridge, um, you'll see that there's a cluster near St. Ives in the, gravel, in the old gravel pits there, uh, Fen Drayton and various others. Uh, there's also a cluster at Camborne. And then just south of Cambridge, you go down to Shepworth, and there's a little cluster there. But I suspect that a lot of the watercourses between Cambridge and, 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 and these various clusters haven't been properly investigated. A lot of them are in, on private land. And I think I'm going to try and get my canoe out next summer and or see, see if I can find a few more. So the conclusions are that Cambridge, Nat His Cam area has 24 species of Odonata. The most diverse location is Ditton Meadows with 21 species and 10 locations out of 26 have more than 15 species. In September 2019, the most abundant damselfly was the willow emerald and a newcomer and, and small red-eyed damselfly is now almost as abundant as the red-eyed damselfly in the city. Lesser emperors and southern migrant hawkers are appearing and they may well be breeding. We've found the white-legged damselfly again in Grantchester Meadows and this diversity of species doesn't just apply to the dragonflies. Many of the groups we've been studying are, are showing great abundance. Cities can be home to an awful lot of wildlife. And then finally, small local nature reserves add diversity and are very worthwhile and more would be very good. Hobson's Park and Trumpington Meadows contain very good habitats and they're well designed and, and show that you can actually gain new habitat from the planning process. The collaborative nature of a project like this has been fantastic. Um, working with this enthusiastic group of people and everybody brings different skills to the task has been absolutely wonderful. And when you do a serious study, people and organisations actually take note uh, and you can influence, you know, things that are happening in the environment of, of, of around your home. And during a pandemic like this, there's been nothing better than actually getting out and feeling that your daily exercise is producing worthwhile results. And uh, we are producing a book. And in fact, we've just found a publisher. So hopefully before too long, there'll be a book about the subject. Thank you very much. <laughs>